first. How are you all doing? Yeah, oh, good. Somebody got the memo. <laughs> so this is the, you know, as the, I'm a terrible first act because I'm very ultra low energy. So you all need to kind of pump yourselves up a little bit. The sort of things that people do in the trader, you know, give me a cheer if you're feeling something. Ooh. <laughs> right, I mean, you know, you work with what you've got, and you'll do. <laughs> yeah, you'll do. Right, so, uh, let's give it a good stab. So, you'll do as an audience, I may or may not do as a performer, but then that's male privilege for you. So, I'm going to let you in a little bit of a trade secret, which is that I do very few gigs. Uh, and because I do very few gigs, I never repeat material, because I always want to try out something new. But to go with that, I rarely ever get around to writing material till two hours before the actual gig. And I settled into this platform, and what I do is about two hours before the gig, uh, I tell my wife and my kid that I'm going out, and I go sit down in a pub, get a glass of wine, and write some material. And so the stuff that you're about to hear is fresh off the page. It's, you know, seriously fresh off the page. And let me tell you, it shows. <laughs> so while I was sitting in the Haymakers, uh, where I've been since 6.30, so I didn't even give myself two hours to write this gig, so you are getting seriously undercompromised on policy here. I was watching the television in an attempt to distract myself from the fact that I had no ideas, and I heard about the collapse of Fly BMI, the airline. Has anybody heard the news? I mean, you know, people are talking of little else in these circles. I'm surprised you've missed out. So Fly BMI is an airline. It's actually pronounced Fly BMI, not flipped me. <laughs> because that confuses it with the urinary catheter of the same name. So Fly BMI has collapsed. And uh, they were interviewing a guy on the television because, you know, that's all we're really good for. Basically, you know, the world is run by the elite. We're box box, pretty much. So John had spent 1,500 on Fly BMI just earlier this week because he traveled to a business and all the flights have canceled and his money's all gone. And so they interviewed him and John said, it's annoying. It's a shame they didn't give us more notice. And now their phone line is dead. And I watched this and I thought to myself, you know, blitz spirit be damned. You know, from a distance, cowardice looks like restraint. Paralytic terror looks like unflinching bravery. And a societal prohibition against expressing outrage at any deprivation of your rights looks remarkably like stoicism. So it's not quite so much that there is the blitz spirit of we shall put up and we shall bear, we simply don't know how to say this is an awful thing and we're not going to stand for it. And the world rumbles on like that. Because four weeks from Brexit, John, who is a type 1 diabetic, will be lying on a trolley in a hospital car park. In a parking bay, he will be in one trolley of eight trolleys that surround the garden umbrella. From the spokes of the garden umbrella will be hanging IV bags. And from the IV bags, fluids will be flowing into each of the occupants of the trolleys. The spouses of these uh, people in the trolleys will be taking turns pedaling an exercise cycle to make the cardiac monitors that their <laughs> spouses have like, up, you know, they have been linked up to keep going. And John's wife, Sally, will be taking her shift and she'll be pedaling furiously on the exercise bicycle. And then she'll fall asleep and she'll fall into sweet dreams of insulin and parmesan. And then all the cardiac monitors will stop. And all the family members will jolt because everybody has died. The cardiac monitors have stopped beeping and then they realize that Sally's fallen asleep. And they've just had that tantalizing prospect of blessed relief snatched from them. And John will be lying there and a reporter will come up to him. And John is lying in bed, he's haggard, he's a pale shell of the man who spoke about Fly BMI and uh, his 1,500 pounds. And the reporter will get up to him and he can smell John's ketotic breath. It smells fruity, it smells like nail polish remover and the reporter feels a sudden craving for nail polish remover. And then he reminds himself that there is no nail polish remover because since Brexit, 
nail polish remover is only to be found in the elite black market pubs where it masquerades as beach schnapps because people will drink anything now. <laughs> and he suppresses the craving. And he does John and says, John, it's been four weeks since Brexit and you haven't had insulin since then. How do you feel? And John, his breath, haggard. It's painful to watch, let alone hear. And he says, it's annoying. <laughs> it's a shame they didn't tell us sooner. And now their phone line is dead. And then it appears so is John, as the machine's all quiet down. And then Sally jumps up and says, Kevin Bear! And she wakes up and starts pedaling again, and the people start going on. People like John are why we are sleepwalking into Brexit, right? We will stoically go looking like, you know, we'll put up with what happens, and then we'll listen to Jacob rees mogg explain to us how insulin and diabetes are something that have to be seen in their historical context. <laughs> and you know, one has to consider that when one thinks of insulin and diabetic ketoacidosis, there is an important context to consider there. So really, one shouldn't make such a fuss about it. And that's probably how we're going to march ourselves into the dark new world of tomorrow. Now, any Americans in the audience? <laughs> there, was a time, there was a time when, you know, that was enough to sort of get the crowd worked out with the deafening, raucous response you got to it. There was one to the very slow hand in the corner there who can't deny that he's American because I know him. <laughs> right. um, but I think, you know, it's all right. I mean, just because you have an orange bastard, he is your president, but he's not your president. In much the same way as, you know, I wouldn't really want you to give me your shit, but I prefer that to you giving me your shit. Right? But the reason I'm grateful to Americans is that because of them, we can still have schadenfreude. One hopes that will grow over time, but the moment has passed. Anyway, I was wondering what would happen when I asked people to raise their hands. Chances are that if there are Americans in the audience, they wouldn't want to. But I think in these troubled times, we're going to be looking at people raising their arms as an indicator to tell friend from foe. You know, when you ask questions and you want to find out who are the people in the audience or who are the people around me I can trust, you're going to be looking at people raising their hands. And it's at this point that angles are going to become so, so important. Right? I'm fairly left wing, so when I raise my hand, I always make sure it's like that. You know, so there's no possibility for confusion. Right? Because it can get quite puzzling. It troubled me for a long while that so many professional swimmers seem to be right wing. <laughs> and then it just occurred to me that I probably shouldn't judge them while they were competing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about a little social psychology experiment, right? What they did was explore this phenomenon called priming. And the idea is that when you give people particular ideas that put them in a particular mindset, you can get them to take on other characteristics and other viewpoints of that mindset. So you sit a group of people down and you talk to them about immigration, you talk to them about welfare and benefit fraud and so on, and you can get people exercised about those things. And then they will betray their actual prejudices in other fairly simple ways. So um, you talk to them about this and then you say, who'd like to have a coffee break now? And then what you do is when people put their hands up, using very sophisticated technology, you just measure the angles of their shoulders and their arms. And you can do that before and after you subject them to that story about immigration and benefit reform, and you will see that the people who are more right-wing, after the story, their hands actually angle forward. <laughs> right? So that's this phenomenon called so in priming in social psychology. And that is why we have a replication crisis in psychology. Because it doesn't work, it's a great story, isn't it? <laughs> Very much like this set. 
Thank you very much. No. <laughs> Woo!